Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Americans 18 years and older are permitted by law to vote. 18 to 29 year olds represent 19% of those who voted in November 2012, according to Edison Research. In 2014, 18 to 29 year olds were 13% of the electorate, according to NBC. Just under half of all 18 to 29 year olds are registered. Why are so few young people interested in who makes the decisions and what those decisions will mean to their long-term prospects? Our guest today is Ken Moffat, Associate Professor of Political Science at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. He teaches American politics and political methodology. But more importantly to this discussion, Dr. Moffat studies patterns of political participation among younger voters. During this half hour, He'll give us some insight. Dr. Moffat, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me. So, um, just a little bit of background. You're at, uh, you're at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Uh, just talk about what it is that you teach and why you teach those courses. So, I came to SIUE in August 2006, and I was hired to teach courses in American politics and also in political methodology. I teach an introductory American politics course right around once a year on average. I also teach a few sections of political methodology as well as courses on Congress and also a course on political scandals in American politics. That must be a pretty good course to take. <laughs> There's no shortage of material yeah. and I just stick to the, the major national level stuff because if we went the state level stuff well, there could be another course on that here in Illinois. Uh, yes, uh, and around the country, <laughs> too. Yes. And you're originally from California? Yes, I am. Grew up in Fresno? Uh, just outside of Fresno in a then small town of Clovis. And I say then because when I grew up there, it was a town of about 40,000. It's now grown to about 120, 130,000. Yikes. California is just growing. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk something about uh, something that you weren't expecting to talk about and neither was I but we talked a little bit about this before we got started on this but it is a political matter Californians are talking about dividing their state into several sections and from these sections creating new states mm -hmm. you're familiar with this yes one why are they thinking this and two what are the realistic prospects of that happening well, as far as why they're thinking it, I would say a few different reasons. One of them has to do with some of the, some of the very different parts of the state being divergent ideologically. So for example, you have the San Francisco Bay Area, you go along the coastline a little bit to the north and also a bit to point south, and then you get to LA County, which are dominantly democratic. You get the interior of the state, which is, which is quite, which is quite red, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So because of that red, that red, that red blue divide, and it isn't say just moderate type conservatism in the central part of the state, it's more conservatism like you would see say in this part of the country mm -hmm. in many, many respects. A little less on the social issues, but in a lot of other respects pretty similar. So consequently in, in state politics, this ends up playing out because in California, there are, there are requirements, say, for the, for the budget, if it doesn't get passed in a relatively timely manner, to have to be approved by a two-thirds vote in both houses of the state legislature. And Democrats out there, until relatively recently, haven't gotten to the two-thirds mark, as far, as far as that goes, to pass what budget they would want to pass, so they've had to rely on some Republican votes. Mm -hmm. And that ends up creating, that ends up begetting some governance difficulties, so to speak. In addition, the, the other reason is culturally in the state, you, you think about the state of California in terms of size, it would run from about Illinois, north southwest from about say the northern part of Illinois down to about the Tennessee, Mississippi border. 
and you can yeah, imagine no, culturally. Well, Calif California is just just huge, and yeah. when you say size-wise, it its population represents mm -hmm. about ten percent of all the electoral votes necessary to elect. Uh, um, no, ten percent of all electoral votes, isn't it? That's right. Because right. they have about ten percent of the whole of the population of the United States mm -hmm. in California, mm -hmm. but they only have two senators. That's right? right. But if you were to start breaking up the state, then suddenly California would have more senators, wouldn't they? Which, in my opinion, is one of the reasons mm -hmm. that the Congress, which has to approve any breakup of a state, won't. I, I agree that that that'd be part of the reason why Congress wouldn't approve. I would, I would think the other reason is that the state constitution, if memory serves me correctly, specifies that, that it would have to go before the voters in the state, and I just don't see something like this getting enough support. So you don't think those L.A. people would like to get rid of those northern folks? <laughs> no. When it comes right down to it, they may well give each other a hard time about cultural aspects, baseball, and other things, but push comes to shove, no. Now, California was all, when I was growing up, and it was, was like the young culture. This is, this is where all the new hip things really started. Um, is it that way still? To some degree it is. So, for example, on the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley very much drives a lot of the high-tech innovations that we get. Home of, say, Apple or Google or others. You also have the film industry down in Southern California, which drives a fair number of the pop culture trends. Mm -hmm. But an interesting thing also in California is that California is changing due to, due to immigration. Okay, so my first question is, are these young people in Silicon Valley, I know about Hollywood, but in Silicon Valley having a um, an impact on political decisions that their stake makes. I, th I think they are. In a and where you see some of the biggest impacts is, is with respect to economic development decisions. And now, also that's, see, to me, that's where young people, I alluded to this mm -hmm. in, the, in the opening script, I, I, uh, I don't think that young people seem to understand, because so many young people say, oh, it's all BS, you know, all this politics stuff. They don't seem to understand that the decisions and policies that are created by elected legislatures and by the national legislature have a great big impact on their future. And, and, on, face, and on face value, I could see why one would draw that conclusion, because after all, younger people vote at lower rates relative to relative to older cohorts. Yes. That said, young people do participate and they are engaged in some other ways. And that engagement tends to be through some of the online forms. Like say, if you look at Twitter or you look at friending and joining groups on, friending candidates joining groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. or, if you, or if you take a look at say blogging and things like that, those activities are done overwhelmingly by younger people. So even if they don't vote, it isn't like, say, they're totally disengaged or what have you. Okay, I mean, I hear what you're saying, that yeah, they're, they're engaged in some ways by having some measure of, I don't know if it's even influence, it's just, well, here's what I think. That mm -hmm. Basically, that's what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so the political people who are running for office are taking into account, well, this group of people think this way, right? That's what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. Okay. But of course, the problem that I see is that unless you go out and pick people through the primary process that you know you can trust to do the things which are in your best interest, which even adults aren't really thinking about that clearly, uh, then you're not going to wind up having the legislature, whether it's Congress or the state, um, actually creating laws which are going to be to your benefit. You know what I, I'm saying? I, I do. So I, uh, does this get taught to, uh, to the young? Like, we're spending a ton of money on, you know, high school. <laughs> I mean, something like ten to 14000 per student per year mm -hmm. to send them to uh, public schools. 
are they being taught these just simple things uh, in civics classes? So for example here in Illinois taking a civics class is a is a requirement for high, for public high school graduates to get their diplomas. Right. And so as such within within that sort of setting they do learn about things like issues and some of the basic structures and processes of American government. Mm -hmm. At SIUE we have a number of students who also choose to take the Intro to American Politics class. Mm -hmm. and That's and one of the general, uh, we used to call them GS classes. Yeah, that's right. I don't know what you call them now. Yeah, yeah, yeah gen eds. So okay. that, that's, that's exactly right. So we have some people taking it as part of that. And in that class, we do talk about some of the structures and processes. We do talk about American political institutions. And this semester, I'm teaching that class. And this semester, we're just starting the political behavior portion, which is where we talk about things like demographics and and how demographics play into the politics of different issues. Well, when these students came to you at the beginning of the semester, did they have an understanding of what I was talking about before? Do they do they have an understanding of the basics and more than just the basics of how governments are formed, but do they understand why we have primaries and what that, you know, by getting down there and choosing the candidates who are actually going to appear on the ballot in November, that that makes a difference rather than, you know, some guy puts his hand up, pick me, pick me, pick me, and you don't know a thing about him for real, uh, but he says a few things that you like and so you vote for him as opposed to going out and finding somebody who's actually interested in putting on the books laws that are going to benefit their generation. And I think... I think in part students do because every semester when I teach this class I get some students who understand pretty well what goes on in terms of the structure and processes and things like that. I get other students who are much less familiar but, but I at my end of it look at that as therein lies a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. that, that even say after the class even if a couple decide to be much more engaged than they were previously then then, then societally, we're better off than we were before. Correct. And those, and those students are better off than they were before. Mm -hmm. now, well, in, in the half, uh, you know, cup half full, a half empty category, there's a whole bunch of them didn't choose to take your class. And that worries me because they don't have an understanding and they're not looking out for their own interests. Believe me, the 65-year-old and older, they know exactly what they're doing and they're making sure that resources are being rejiggered from society, from the young to the old right mm -hmm. now. The boomers are really, really adept at this, mm -hmm. as were the previous generation. And I, I just get the feeling that young people don't understand that there are resources which are being um, uh, reprogrammed, there's the proper term, reprogrammed mm -hmm. from their generation to other generations. And, and, and that's something that, 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 I do, that I do talk about with students in a class or what have you. That said, like you pointed out, there are lots of students who choose not to take that class mm -hmm. and choose, and in, in, in so choosing, miss out on that opportunity to learn about these kinds of things. That said, I th there are, that said, age acts as something of a proxy for education. Where, where, the, where the older one gets, the more likely he or she is to vote and also participate in American politics by some other means. Mm -hmm. So if you compare baby boomers, say at, say at the similar age group back in the 1960s, you, you didn't necessarily see tons of them voting per se, and they voted at actually pretty similar rates as 18 to 25 year olds do today. I see. But that said, with the baby boomer generation, like say my parents' generation for example, as they got older, they became much more participatory in civic life. That includes voting, that includes joining interest groups, giving to candidates, and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, you, and we're starting to see some of the older members of, say, Gen Y, or the members who are, or those people who are on the back end of Gen X, becoming much more participatory and much more active in politics. 
explain those two terms that you just used so people know what you're referring so to. Ge so Generation X as a generic term, I would say refers to anybody somewhere in about the 30 to 40 year old range. Whereas Generation Y refers to those people, I would say, who are right now somewhere between 18 and about 28, 29 or so. Though the definitions vary a little bit depending on which demographer you talk to. I always thought that the term Gen X was so derogatory of a group of, uh, of young people. Yeah, as somebody on the back end of that generation, I'd concur with that. <laughs> it's just, it was like a, the back of the hand that was, was given to a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of young people. Um, and uh, the, the Gen Y that you're referring to is also referred to uh, as the millennials, correct? That's right. These are the kids who were coming of age as we moved into, not even coming of age, they were just still very young as we came into the 21st century. Yeah, that's right. And they're the, the I guess they're probably the age of most of our soldiers, the, uh, the enlisted groups. That's right. So tell me, what, what are young people taking your class? What are they thinking politically? What do they want? What do they want their world to look like? What, what, what is it uh, in an ideal way that the world would do? I would say there's a couple different things that this generation values. One of them is that they've, they value diversity, and very much so, in terms of racial diversity, ethnic diversity, and what have you. Another thing that they, that they, tend, to, that they tend to value, and public opinion-wise, are overwhelmingly in support of, and that is, say, gay marriage and other, and, and other rights for gays and lesbians, transgender individuals, and what have you. Mm -hmm. so, so, for example, I, in, I walk into my classes, I can reasonably expect that about 80% will hold, about 80% of the class will hold one or both of those viewpoints mm -hmm. at, at any given time. Why those two particular areas of interest as opposed to what am I going to do to make money? Well, and, 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 I, would, and I would say why, why those two? I would say with, this, with the second one, this generation grew up, many members of this generation grew up with, say, Massachusetts legalizing gay marriage in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then the legal fight to, le not, to not only legalize gay marriage around the country, but also enact other, other measures to protect the rights of gays, lesbians, transgender individuals. So it's something they grew up with. And, it, and there's a, something of a loose analogy there between that and, say, the civil rights movement out of the 1950s and 1960s mm -hmm. that, the, that an earlier generation grew up with. I see. But that said, as far as millennials, you are absolutely right about another thing that consistently comes out in the survey of college freshmen that UCLA does every year that one of their priorities in going to college is to exit with a degree with which they will then be able to make money. And from your studies, what percentage of these young people who get a bachelor's degree are actually getting a, um, a salary after school that allows them to live what used to be called the American, the American dream? I would say it varies considerably depending on major. So for example, if you say look at nursing majors, engineering majors, and finance majors, they tend to do fine. Mm -hmm. You look sociology. at sociology. <laughs> right, so, English. Right, sociology, English, the arts tends to be a little bit rougher of an economic proposition initially. But what ends up happening with those majors is they catch up by about the mid-career point because, because they use some of the other skills that they learn in those majors to end up being able to have an impact in the workforce, whatever environment they choose. Mm -hmm. Political science majors, many of them do, do reasonably well initially, but where they really excel is once they get a graduate degree. I wanna go back to what, what we were talking about earlier about uh, participation in voting. I thought it was interesting what you were saying that even though they're not participating in the actual going out and going to the, you know, to filling in the ovals or going and touching the machine, that they feel like that they're participating in the political process. 
Tell me some more about, uh, about that thinking process. So, so for example, you, you, look at, you look at the cost calculus for younger people as far as participating. Voting is a relatively high cost endeavor because with voting, one has to register, one has to figure out where the polling place is, and then do enough research about the candidates to figure out how it, how it is they're going to vote. Join the crowd. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. That said, a, 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 lower, a lower cost endeavor would be, say, to friend candidates and, and, jo and join groups, say, on Facebook in some of the, on, in some of the online forums. Mm -hmm. Because they could, they could do that, say, either from the dorm room, from the library, or any number of other locations from which they, from, from which they choose to do it. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can also, if they, if they want to put themselves out and engage in a little bit more costly of an endeavor, they can, they can start a blog. Or they can contribute to a blog in varying ways about politics. Mm -hmm. if, if, say, they want to, want to send out a brief tweet, they can do that too. If they want to follow somebody, via Twitter, they can do that too. And with Facebook and Twitter, about 90 plus percent of members of the 18 to 25 year old age group have Facebook and they have Twitter. Okay, now these, these young people, not the ones who are 18 to 25 now, but the mm -hmm. ones who are 18 to 25 in the year 2008, mm -hmm. that was a very, that was a target group by the Obama campaign. Yes, it okay. was. Um, before, before President Obama became President Obama, mm -hmm. as candidate Obama, his his people learned how to target Twitter, and YouTube, mm -hmm. and uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. and many other mechanisms. Uh, why was it that young people responded so well? From from your perspective, I, w I would say part of it was that a year before Barack Obama, a year before two thousand eight, and a year before the first primary. Barack Obama had a, had a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg and the entire Facebook board. And what his campaign wanted to do was to find out how to engage younger people in ways that are meaningful to them. And so, for example, there was a big push via Facebook. So, for example, he set up, he set up his candidate page. Also set up, set up an interactive website. Was also the first of the presidential candidates to set up an app. Mm -hmm. that downloaded to a smartphone. What was it though that Zuckerberg and his team told them that young people would be responding to? Do you, do you know this? Uh, that information is much less clear. But I do know, but I can say for certain that the meeting did take place. Mm -hmm. also, also, as far as the campaign organization, one of, one of the central themes that they did was Talk, was talked a little bit about to younger people student loans and and once Barack Obama became president what he did through the Affordable Care Act was was for federally subsidized and unsubsidized student loans ended up ended up taking those out of the hands of private lenders and putting them in the hands of the Department of Education well, I remember they kind of nationalized. That's right. Student loans. That's exactly right. Okay. And and also lowered the interest rates on those. Has that worked out for students to the better, or or not made any difference? To the to the better, as far as say lowering the interest rate. That said, the cost of college has still gone up. And very, still very, very much so. That's that's right. Uh, by the way, we got about five minutes left okay. here. So, um, and I always tell my guests at this point, if there's anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to talk about, let's you know, let's do it. Um, the cost of college is another big issue, like I was referring to before, when you're mm -hmm. picking people who are going to go to the state legislature. They're the ones who really, I don't know if they actually set the uh, you know the tuition rates but they put all the people in position who are gonna make those decisions, don't they? Do uh, young people understand this? Uh, many, many don't, but increasingly so, people are starting to, to understand it. 
And in part, many young people are starting to understand in ways that they might not have previously because the cost goes up and it becomes in their economic self-interest to do that. But you are, but you are absolutely right that, 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 I, that it would be a good thing for younger people to pay closer attention to what goes on in the state legislature because in Illinois, they confirm the appointments for who's going to sit on the different boards with respect to, say, the Southern Illinois University system, for example. Wasn't there like some huge fight, some food fight, not very long ago about uh, who was going to sit on the SIU board? There was. So, the, so Governor Quinn made a series of appointments to the board without consulting the state senate. And the state senate, to protest not being consulted about it, decided to reject all of his appointments on a unanimous vote. And so he had to remake the appointments, some of which ended up being the same people. He consulted with the state senate. Off it goes. So, that, so for example, the SIU board, they set the tuition rates for SIUE, SIU Carbondale, and also the SIU med school up in Springfield. Mm -hmm. Another thing they also set, which indirectly plays into what tuition is, is they set what the state funding is for the different state universities. Right. And... As, as funding goes down, tuition goes up because the universities it have to... It costs a certain amount. Somebody's got to pay for it. Yeah, that's And exactly yet SIU right. is still a pretty good uh, deal when you compare the cost of going to other universities, uh, even within Illinois, uh, you know, to going to SIUE. Yeah, that's right. And it's a really good deal also for, for Missouri residents because in-state tuition has also, been has also been extended over to Missouri residents. How far into Missouri do we go? Like I, the whole St. Louis County area or beyond I, that? I know for sure St. Louis City, St. Louis County, St. Charles County. I can say that much for sure, but I'm pretty sure that it was extended out to the whole state. And it was also extended out to Arkansas and also to Indiana and to Wisconsin. Smart move. Yes, it is. Very smart move to get, yes, it is. You know, getting more bodies in there and having them bring money. That's exactly right. So um, I guess as we're, we're coming to the end of this, uh, of this particular program, would you like to simply, uh, in the next 30 seconds, just summarize what you think that young people are going to be doing over the next, say, decade um, politically? I think, they're going to become, I think they're going to become more active, and they're going to become more active in ways that we wouldn't traditionally think. That's okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I talk to a lot of young people deliberately, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. on the street or, or wherever, and it's like they just, to my way of thinking, they just don't seem to have a clue as to how the world actually works. But that's another day. Thank you very much for being with us. I appreciate your being here. All right. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with Dr. Ken Moffat. He's an associate professor of political science at Southern Illinois University. We've been talking about, um, uh, well, how young people look at politics, how they fit into the political uh, scene. Uh, this show is going to be uploaded to YouTube, so if you came in the middle, just go to YouTube and you'll be able to see the rest of it. For the rest of you, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.